Hello, online family. I'm David, and I want to welcome you to our online service. In a few minutes, we're going to worship together and continue our series through the book of Ruth with Pastor John. But before we do, we just wanted to say thank you to those of you who have filled out an online service survey. It's really helping us plan and pray through what's next for our online services. If you haven't filled out that survey yet, we would love you to take some time to do that this weekend. And if you didn't receive that email, make sure you take some time to go to ucov.com online and fill out our online connection card and indicate you regularly attend our online services. And we'll get you that survey this week. Thank you. Now here's what's coming up at our church. First, we want to invite you to an in-person lunch reception this Sunday, August 7th, for one of our global workers from Thailand, Sherry Cuisenberry. This lunch will be after our 11 a.m. service in the UCC Youth Center starting at 12.30, hosted by our global outreach team. We would love for you to come and hear about what Sherry is doing and take some time to pray over her and her mission. We also want to invite you to a new study by Pastor Susan Cosio called Drawing Near to God. Spiritual practices can draw us near to God and help us sense God's presence in our lives. If you'd like to learn some ways to deepen your spiritual life, join this three-week study on Monday evenings, August 8th, 15th, and 22nd at 7.30 p.m. in the youth room at UCC. If you have any questions, simply email susan at susan.ucov.com. As a church family, one way we serve each other is by prayer. Whether you are a regular attender or a first-time guest, we would love to pray for you. So if you would like us to partner with you in prayer or to celebrate you with, with you in praise, simply go to ucov.com prayer. Write out your prayer request or praise and know that our prayer team will welcome the opportunity to pray for you during this week. Thank you again for being here with us online. As we continue our service, we, will you please join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we just come before you today, uh, we get the opportunity to look at the book of Ruth. And Lord, I pray that as we uh, just think through this narrative, that we would realize just all the different ways you are working within our lives, even through the good and the bad, and that you are writing wonderful and beautiful stories, even though we may not see it in the midst of it. And so, Lord, I pray that if anybody listening to this um, is going through a season where they cannot see God, I pray that you would comfort them today and to allow them to see just how loved they are. Pray these things in your son's name. Amen. We're reaching out to welcome you, God. Fill this place again with your song. Flood our thoughts. a greater glimpse of a never-changing God. And all we want and all we need is found in you, found in you, Jesus. Every victory is found
Let's sing that again together. And in your presence there is freedom. It was a pretty scary situation from what they told me. Uh, they told me it was, it was a new land, a new language, different customs, um, different nuances that they were totally unfamiliar with. They came into this land uh, with hope, but also with fear of where they're going to make it. Uh, they had to find jobs. They had to find a home. Uh, they looked for a church, but all of it was cross-cultural. All of it was strange. All of it was fearful because they just missed some of the nuances. They would say certain words and be misunderstood. Their accents were sometimes made fun of or, or, or uh, mocked. But they tell me that there were two people that made a huge difference in their lives. Two people who, who God provided as a link, as, as advocates for them. They were really unexpected. It was unexpected and they were so grateful for. One was their pastor. They had joined this church that uh, they weren't familiar with. They were uh, few, one of the few immigrants in this church, but this pastor just sponsored them, came to their house, made sure they had friends, made sure they met people in the church, uh, opened themselves up to, if you have any questions, help us link you up. And they found that to be so refreshing, so um, comforting. They weren't alone. And they had someone who knew the culture, knew the ins and outs of the culture advocating for them. The other big win was a, a person who uh, hired one of them. He had immigrated 30 years before, so he understood the, tr the struggle, he understood the questions, and he understood the hardships. And he went to this person and said, I'm going to look out after you. I'm your boss, but I'm also going to be your sponsor. And he hooked him up with resources and opportunities career-wise that, honestly, he should have never had on his own. His accent, his lack of knowledge of culture, his lack of knowledge of the nuances should have really uh, precluded him from moving up the ladder. But he had someone in the company looking out for him saying, I'm going to connect you. I'm going to advocate for you. These two people, this pastor and this boss, were two people my parents shared with me who were God gifts to them when they immigrated to the United States. They had family here already, and they, the family was able to help out, but there was so much unknown. Uh, language barriers, cultural barriers, economic barriers, friendship barriers, job barriers. And it seemed like God provided these two people who were familiar with the culture, who already were in, who were connected, who had resource. But they didn't just hold on to their resource and say, yay for me. They looked out for people who may not have those advantages and said, you know what, we're going to protect you. We're going to sponsor you. We're going to advocate for you. We're going to connect you. And that made such a huge difference. We're continuing the book of Ruth, and this is one of my favorite chapters, Ruth chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to it, or also the words will be on the screen. 
But we're going to look at a man named Boaz. If you missed last week, uh, the, the context of the story is that uh, Ruth uh, immigrated from Moab to Bethlehem with her mother-in-law, Naomi. And they have a lot going against them. Um, they're both widows. And this is a culture where economic security came through men. So you either had to have a husband or a son, of which they had neither. Uh, while uh, Naomi was from Bethlehem, Ruth was not. Ruth was a Moabite. And Moabites were minorities who were not well liked by those from Bethlehem. So here you have Ruth, who's a young female with no economic support, a minority in terms of culture and language and nuance, and they immigrate to this new town. So if you will turn to Ruth chapter 2, I'm going to actually read all the way through and comment along the way. And then after we get through it, I want to just share some highlights, especially from the person of Boaz. Let's read Ruth chapter 2, verse 1. Now, Naomi, this was Ruth's mother-in-law, had a relative on her husband's side. Remember, her husband had passed away. A man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. Now, Elimelech was Naomi's husband who had passed away. And she has a relative who is called a man of standing. He's a man of character, a man of prestige in the community. And his name was Boaz. And Ruth, Naomi's mother-in-law, the Moabite, and here the author really stresses that Ruth is not from this area. Now Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the field and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone whose eyes I may find favor. These people have no money and they have no food and they have no resources and no inn. And so what Ruth says, hey, mother-in-law, we are going to be hungry. <clears throat> We're going to be starving. Let me go to the harvest. This is the harvest time of barley. Usually it's March or April. And I'm just going to follow the people who are harvesting. And whatever is left over on the ground, I'm going to pick that up for ourselves. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out entered a field and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. It just, quote, happened, if you don't believe in God and just believe in total coincidence, that the one field she decided to glean after was the field that belonged to Boaz, who was actually a relative of Naomi's passed away husband. If you believe in God, which we do, we believe that God's hand was all over this. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. These are the people who work for him. He says, the Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. And you get this sense that there's some camaraderie between Boaz and his workers, his harvesters. They like each other, they love each other, and they mutually bless each other in God's name. Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters, who does that young woman belong to? As Boaz comes, he notices that there are people who are harvesting and there are uh, workers for him. And there might even be some people who are gleaning after the harvesters who might be poor. But he sees a new woman and he just assumes that she's a servant of somebody in his town. Who does she belong to? The overseer replied, she is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter. Now, the fact that he refers to her as daughter probably implies there's a significant age difference between the two. My daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. He lays out the welcome, welcome man. He says, you know what? What you're doing, stay here. Each day, you can stay here during the harvest. No need to go to find someone else's field. She says, stay here with the women who work for me. Now, how this worked is usually the men um, and the women work together. The men would often be the, the pluckers of the harvest, and the women would often be the gatherers and putting uh, the wheat together uh, in sheaves. Uh, and so she said, he says, watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along with the women. In other words, he's saying you can now, instead of dragging behind the women and picking up the leftovers, you can actually work with the women. I have told you, I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. In other words, you might get in trouble for doing this, for joining the women. But he says, I told the men, it's okay with me. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. 
I just want you to catch what he does right here. He provides so much. And now he's saying, you know, instead of just being a poor person who goes behind, I want you to get a drink from the water jars that these men who work for me are filling up. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me a foreigner? Boaz replied, I have been told of all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and your mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Boaz says, you don't understand this. Your story has been spreading. We kind of know about who you are. I didn't realize you were that woman. When I saw you, I didn't know you were her. But once my workers told me who you were, I knew your story and your character impressed me. You are amazing. You have put yourself under the care of God who you did not know for the sake of your mother-in-law. He says, I want to make sure you're okay. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. She's like, you're giving me status that I didn't even have. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here. Have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvester, he offered her some roasted grain. He takes someone who doesn't even work for him, someone who is in poverty, begging, taking scraps, and says, I want you to sit at the same table my male harvester sit at, and I want to give you some food. She ate all she wanted, and she had some left over. As she got up to glean, she's going to go back and do what she was doing. Boaz gave orders to his men, let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. Even pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. He says, let her keep gathering, just like she said. In fact, as you have your bundles, will you just pull some out and leave it on the ground so she can gather some of those as well? So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she gathered, sorry, then she threshed the barley <clears throat> she had gathered. Now, I'm not an ag person. We live in an ag town. But when you gather wheat, it's the barley, it's the seeds that make the most difference. And so you have to do some work to separate the seeds from the rest of the wheat. So she did that and it amounted to about what they call an ephah. That's about five gallons. If you imagine a one gallon uh, bottle of or a container of milk, just imagine five of those of seed. It's a huge harvest for one day. She carried it back to town and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. She said, look at all that I gathered and I brought some doggy bags for you too. Her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. She clues in like, whatever just happened was unusual. Give me the, give me the, the down low. What happened? Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today, his name is Boaz, she said. This random guy who was really kind to me. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He, and then she's referring here to Boaz, has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our, and he she uses this phrase, guardian redeemers. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Then Ruth the Moabite said, he even said to me, stay with my workers until they finish the harvest of har harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work for him, because in someone else's field, you might be harmed. You might be taken advantage of. So Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvests were finished. And she lived with her mother-in-law. Man, I just love this story. I just love this story. And I wish I could see you because I'd ask a race of hands, how many of you want to be like Boaz? I mean, if you just were raise your hand, I mean, this guy seems so awesome. He's a man of character. Uh, he's well-loved. He uh, owns a field. He sees someone who's disadvantaged and cares for her. Um, he's generous. There's just all these things. And I'm like, I want to be a Boaz. And honestly, as I think about it, I just think our world needs more Boazes. And I think as a church, we can be Boazes by God's grace. I want to share 
in about three counterintuitive ways to care. There are some things that Boaz does in terms of care that I don't, I think are counterintuitive and really mess with the ways we care. And often all of our care comes out of a good intention and good motives. But there are ways that Boaz cares that I think would be very good for us to study and to understand because it's ways that we can care for those as well. And ultimately it's ways that God cares for us. So these are the three counterintuitive ways. The first thing I wanna call is, is sponsoring. The second is to dignify. And the third is to connect. Let's talk about sponsor. When we often think of caring, we, uh, or even, how, let me phrase it this way, when we think of mentoring, we often think of a mentoring type of person who shares wise counsel. You know, we say, I want a mentor. I want someone who's gonna share wise counsel. And that's a very valid way of mentoring. There's a professor named Robert Clinton. He goes by Bobby Clinton, who was over at Fuller that wrote a book called Connecting. And he actually says, as you look through scripture, there's not one way of mentoring. There's actually nine different ways of mentoring. And one of these ways is called sponsoring. Now, most of the mentoring we're familiar with is kind of what Naomi does with Ruth. If you notice at the end of the chapter, Naomi tells Ruth, it'd be wise for you to stay with Boaz. That's the kind of mentoring we're used to. Someone who's older and wiser and gives sound, sage advice. And that's a very important way of mentoring. But there's a way that we often don't talk about that I think is a very important skill, especially for us in Davis, called sponsoring. Sponsoring is when you take your connections your resources, your status, and purposely connect people who don't have that with those resources. You're a door opener. You're a connector to people or resources that people would normally not have without your help. Boaz totally did this. Boaz was a landowner. He had people working for him. And he immediately gave Ruth status that she would not have on her own. He immediately connected her with the right people that she would not have on her own. Here's the interesting thing about sponsoring. Sponsoring isn't super relationally intensive. It's not like Boaz spent the whole day with her. In fact, if you look at this first day, he had moments with her, but most of what he did was connect her with the right people. He connected her by, by telling his harvesters, hey, let her, let her do a little more than we normally let people do. He connected her by introducing her to the women and, and giving her connection there. He connected her by bringing her to a table where the workers eated, uh, eated <laughs> where the workers ate. And all of this was using his resources to provide. When I think about my parents, uh, the pastor and this, this supervisor, the main thing they did was they weren't necessarily relationally intensive. Now, don't get me wrong. There is a relational type of mentoring, and so many of you are great at that, and keep doing that. What I want to do is add another tool to your toolbox, and this is the idea of sponsoring, where you see that you have connections that another person does not have, but because of what you recognize in them, you are going to use your privileges and your responsibilities to make those uh, connections and be an open door person, open up the gates to opportunities. I remember um, uh, several of us on our staff team went recently to a denominational conference called Midwinter, Midwinter last January. And for the three people who came with me, uh, not all, but most of them, it was their first time going to this conference. And this is where you meet all the other pastors, people in our denomination, now, I've been part of our denomination maybe for 15 years now, so I just know tons of people. I know what people are in charge of. I know where to go if I need certain resources. And I just got so excited introducing three of our staff to so many people that week. Uh, we met, I, I introduced them to people who do spiritual direction, people who... Um, uh, our, our leaders of different ethnic uh, associations in our denomination, uh, people who are in charge of helping us get ordained. And these introductions, there was so much joy. And it wasn't like I needed to handhold them, but I just wanted to know, let our staff know, these are people whom you can connect with for resourcing. And like I said, my parents experienced the same thing. Now, in Davis, many of us have a lot of resources. Many of us are professors or uh, work in the school district or uh, work uh, in the medical industry. And you can be resource providers and open things up for people. Often what happens is you're gonna recognize someone who shows some type of potential or character. Boaz totally saw that with Ruth. He wasn't just a sponsor to anyone, but he realized that Ruth had potential because of some of the decisions she made with her mother-in-law 
it clued him into, this is a woman of character. She may not have means, she may be disadvantaged, she may be a foreigner or an immigrant, but I see something in her, but she will be stuck in this pattern unless I connect her with the right resources. And so he took it upon himself to do that. Brothers and sisters, <clears throat> I want you to think about what you're resourced in. Some of you have skills and connections and um, uh, avenues because of your life experience that others don't have, but there may be someone that you see who has potential in areas that you already have inroads with. I want to challenge you to think of how can you be a sponsor? How can you introduce people to resources they may not already have? We minimize this way of, of mentorship, but it's so important. And we need to realize that Ruth was more or less stuck in her situation unless she had a Boaz who saw her potential and connected her with the right people. This is a counterintuitive way to be a mentor. This is a counterintuitive way to be a caretaker. It's a way of saying, God, what privileges have you given me and how can I be a door opener to people who may not have those resources were it not for me? It's a way of advocating that's super powerful. And I wanna challenge you to look through the ways you are privileged and look for someone who may not have that privilege yet, but because of you, you can open up some doors for them. It's a great way of caring. It's a great way of uh, shipping people out into opportunities and privileges they may not otherwise, otherwise have. But that's not the only thing Boaz did. Not only did he sponsor, uh, he dignified as well. I need to help you understand something that was going on um, in the Old Testament back then. Our God is so amazing. When he wrote the Old Testament law and gave the law, he provided an avenue for those who were stuck in poverty. He instructed those to, who had fields. He said, when you collect your grain, when you harvest, purposely don't harvest all the way to the edges. In fact, leave some corners unharvested. And he says, purposely don't collect the things that you drop on the ground when you're harvesting. Why? God says, because I want to give space for those who are living in poverty to gather that on their own after you. So in the healthiest days of the country of Israel, they purposely did not fully harvest and they purposely did not re-go back after they harvested and pick up all the things that fell on the ground. Why? They wanted to leave room for people who were gathering, who were poor, excuse me, to gather. Now, as you recall, we are in the day of the judges and the days of the judges uh, this was a bad season for Israel. So we're unclear if people were really following God's law. This was a time where people did what was right in their own eyes. So just because this was a law didn't mean that the harvesters or the owners of fields back then necessarily followed the law. But we find out that Boaz did. Boaz went against the grain of his culture in the time. He said, hey, country, even though that you are not following God in this season, I know what God has done for us, and I'm going to be a God follower. So he instructed his har harvesters to purposely follow the law of God so that people who are poor can harvest as well. Now, some of you will look at what Boaz did and call him mean. Some of you who care for those who are struggling will call him mean. And here's why you might say this. Here is a woman who is widowed. Here is a person living in poverty. Here's a person who has no connections. And Boaz, you would think, would say, oh, you poor person, let me just give you wheat. Let me just give you barley. This is called relief kind of work. Let me explain this. This is really important to understand. There are times where as Christians we're to give relief. Whenever there's a catastrophe, whenever there's someone who is in dire need because of an emergency, relief work is, let me just give you money. Let me just give you food. Let me just give you what you need. And there is a space, a godly, holy space for that. And our church has been so generous with disaster relief, with helping people in need. We have a deacon's fund that helps people in our church who are in crisis. There is a godly place for relief. But there is a point where relief can be more harmful than helpful. There have been a couple books written in the last decade by Christian authors. One is called uh, When Helping Hurts. The other is called Toxic Charity. And it's uh, this idea that sometimes in our good intentions, in a heart that cares, the way we provide care actually ends up harming more over the long term than helping. One book, Toxic Charity, gives an example. Often we collect gifts 
over in Christmas for families. And what we've realized over time that when strangers bring gifts to kids out of charity, out of kindness, it actually robs the parents of dig dignity. Parents now need to watch their kids receiving gifts from strangers in a way that they weren't able to provide gifts themselves. And while it seems helpful, while it seems kind, while it feels like it's relief work, it actually in the long term robs of dignity. What some of these authors suggest is instead of just giving away gifts, why not have parents, why not set up a shop where church donates gifts, but then parents can come and shop for those gifts at a discounted price. So it's the parents who are able to say, I did this. I went out and, and shopped and I'm the one giving the gifts to my kids. See, you would think that a kind thing would be for Boaz to every day just give Ruth wheat, just give her barley, but he doesn't do that. He actually provides a way for her so she can work for herself. And yes, there's advantages given, there's grace given, there's doors open that she wouldn't have normally otherwise. But in the end of the day, she's able to say, I worked for this. You notice that she's the one that had to thresh the barley from the wheat. Uh, there was no help given. You notice that she that had to actually go pick up the grain, even though there were advantages. So at the end of the day, even though she was receiving help, she was actually given dignity as well. So one of the counterintuitive ways that we want to learn to care as a church is to continue with relief work. Relief work is so important for people who are uh, hit crisis. I've hit crisis before and relief work has been so kind to me. But relief work repeated over and over again for the same people ends up robbing of dignity and not helping them in the long term. And Boaz knows this. In fact, God knows this. God set up a, a relief system that actually had people uh, participate in relieving themselves out of their own poverty. I think we can learn to do that better as a church. You know, where I, I was dreaming with someone on our staff team of wouldn't it be great to open up a cafe that employed people who were trying to get back on their feet and gave them job skills. Uh, and it would maybe temporary, maybe they worked for a year and then got another job, but we got to be part of that. You know, I don't know if God's gonna open up opportunities like that for us, but to be able to sponsor things where not only are we providing for immediate needs, but we're actually serving people in a way that we don't rob their dignity in the process. So I want to ask you, as you think of your own generosity, I want to plead with you to continue with what we call relief work. This is where you're helping people in catastrophe, helping people who have a really urgent need that needs to be satisfied. But will you also look for organizations that serve people in a way that give them dignity? Where it's not just relief, but you're actually giving them job skills. You're having them participate in the relief of their poverty so that they can walk away with their held, heads held high. Will you watch out for organizations that, that sometimes want to help, but the way they do it may end up hurting in the long haul? Will you look for and try to encourage organizations in relief work that actually gives dignity as well? Boaz does this, and I think that we can be people that not only sponsor, but also dignify as we serve as well. The third counterintuitive way to care, the first is uh, to sponsor, the, the second is dignity, or to dignify. Here's the third way, it's to connect people, to connect. Maybe some of you had this experience. I remember the first time I went to an impoverished town in Mexico. We went there with our church to, to support local churches there, and I saw these kids playing in the dirt. Uh, their toys were not electronic toys. They weren't video games. They were little wooden tops spitting on the dirt roads, wearing little clothing. And everything in me would think they must be unhappy. But probably the most disturbing thing to me coming from a first world country was, these kids are so happy. They are so happy. And I remember going away going, what is going on? Because I connected poverty with unhappiness. And here I saw kids and families who lived well below what I came from in my family. And they were way happier than me or the people I knew. And then I remember watching a movie called Happiness and they studied what makes people happy and they went to this impoverished area in India and followed this guy around who was living in slum, who was living in the slums and they did this assessment of his happiness level versus those in the states and wealthy countries. They found that he was happier than most people in the states. Here's what these two stories had in common. Both the little kid I met in an impoverished area in Mexico and this man who was in an impoverished town in India, they had strong community 
and strong connection. The man in India just loved his family. He had kids and a wife, and he loved playing with them. He got so much joy from that. Uh, this little boy had a community, a town that was always together and hanging out, and it wasn't just his family he hung out with, but other families, and they, he had multiple, quote, parents in this community. And one of the conclusions that I think we see that the greatest form of poverty, the greatest form of poverty is loneliness. More than anything, loneliness robs us of a life that God wants to have for us. And it's interesting that one of the first thing Boaz says to Ruth is, I want you to hang with these women. We may see that as a, as a, a side note, but when you understand the true nature of poverty and recognize that poverty and relationships go together and most poverty is rooted in a lack of connection that leads to a lack of opportunity, then you understand how important connection is. And I think Boaz was so wise. He says, what you need are people in your life. What you need are relationships. You're Yes, you're hungry. I'm going to provide for that. Yes, you need sponsorship. I'm going to connect you to the right resources. But one of your greatest needs is just friendship. And this little thing of, and it's repeated over and over again, hang with the women. Hang with the women. Even, even Naomi says, hang with the women. We don't understand. This is just a huge thing that Boaz was providing. She now, this Moabite, this foreigner, this person who's unfamiliar with the culture, this lonely person is now going to have friends. Why? Because every day she's going to go harvest with them. Every day, there's going to be these little communication things going on. What do you do for fun? fun? Tell me about your family. Tell me about your life. What are you doing after work? Every day, these bonds are going to be formed, and Boaz knew that. It's an counterintuitive way to care, but brothers and sisters, one of the greatest ways you can care for people in need is not only to sponsor them, not only to give them dignity and how you serve, but to think through who else can you connect with? Who else do you need to know? You know, uh, one of my secrets, and I'm just outing this right now, is when I meet new people at church, not only am I trying to get to know them, but there's another question in my mind going on, and the question is, who do I need to introduce them to that they can bond and build friendships with? Because I believe that that is one of the greatest ways God cares for us is through friendships. And, you know, I'm a broken record here, but we are in a high anxiety and high depression era of our country. And most people are connecting it to loneliness. We have fewer friends. We have fewer places of intimacy. We have fewer people to go to in times of crisis. And we wonder, why are people so anxious? Why are people so depressed? Because God God created you and me for community. He created us to belong. And when you see someone who doesn't belong, one of the greatest gifts you can give, brothers and sisters, is to help connect them. Now, sometimes the connection is you. Sometimes you become friends with these people. But most often, and here's a tool I want to give you that Boaz uses, most often the connection isn't you. You're trying to think through, out of love for this person, who can I connect them with who has the potential of developing friendships and bonds with them? Is there a people group? Is there a life group? Is there a community? Is there a class? And you help connect. This is counterintuitive because when we think, oh, how do I care for someone? We say things like, let's pray for them. Let's do it. Let's give them money. Let's do it. Please, I'm not bashing any of those. What I want to share with you is that there are additional tools that Boaz use, uses that often go deep. Things like sponsorship, things like giving dignity in terms of how you serve, and things like helping people connect. Can I just challenge you to be a connector? When you come to church and you meet with a new person, will you help them think through who I can connect you with? I saw a story uh, where a, a, a young lady came to our church a few weeks ago, and I was introduced to her, but I was introduced to her by someone else in our church who was giving her a tour of the church. She was having her meet people. She was showing her our life groups. She was introducing her to those in our welcome center. She was just trying to get her connected. And I thought, you understand. You get what's going on. And you should have seen this lady's face. She was just beaming with so much joy. She was new to the community, new to the town, and she was given resources. Man, can I just talk about this? This idea that someone might want to sponsor you and provide you with the right resources because of their status. This idea that someone might want to serve you but in a way that gives you dignity where you're a co-participant in your own uh, getting out of your troubles. 
This idea of someone who connects you with community and wants you to have friends, isn't that beautiful? I mean, how how many of you want a Boaz in your life? I mean, I want that Boaz. Now, I want to give you a preview. And really, I'm going to jump into next week's sermon for just a little bit. Um, Boaz is called a kinsman redeemer. Um, This is a position where someone who is related to someone who's passed away has a responsibility for caring for that family and redeeming them. This word redeemer is first applied to God in the Bible. God is a redeemer. The word redeem is to rescue someone out of a dire situation, out of, and it, out of a cost to yourself. Sometimes when um, God saw people who he loved and they were in trouble, he called himself a redeemer. He was going to go rescue them, but it would come at a cost to himself. And then when God gave the laws of the Old Testament, he, he uh, personified this in the laws. And he said, hey, I want some of you to be kinsmen redeemers. And that when one of your relatives gets into trouble, I want you at your own cost to redeem them. Some of the ways we see this is that when people got into slavery because of debt they got into, that a kinsman redeemer could pay their way out of slavery. So in the, uh, in the chapter of Ruth chapter 2, uh, God gives a preview that, that um, Boaz has this role in Ruth's life, that he is a kinsman redeemer. But really, let me just talk about this, that Boaz is just a preview of who Jesus is. People call Jesus the greater Boaz. I mean, think of what Jesus has done for you and me. He actually sponsors us. He uses his status and gives us his status. He is pure and righteous, and we become righteous because he sponsored us. He is one who gives us dignity. He he has a mission for us, but he doesn't do everything for us. He asks us to participate with him. And ultimately, he connects us with a wider community called the church. This is Jesus. So I just want to say anything you like about Boaz, anything you say, gosh, I want to be a Boaz, will you just give that to God and say, God, thank you for being like this. Jesus, thank you for being like this. And what it is is that Jesus does this for us so that we can be the same with other people. So I pray our church community becomes a people of care, that we bring relief to those who are needy. We bring care and prayer to those who are needy. But we also use three creative tools, that of sponsorship, of giving dignity and connection as well. And let us be a church that cares well for those in our community. God bless you guys.
again with us. Turn your eyes. So Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Just a reminder, make sure you take some time to go to ucov.com online to fill out that online connection card, and we will keep you up to date on all things related to our online community. We also want to say thank you to everyone who gives regularly to UCC. Your financial giving supports everything we do here at UCC, from supporting our global outreach workers to the production of this online service. If UCC is your home church and you would like to partner with us in giving, or if you are a guest and would like to make a one-time gift, we welcome you to join with us in supporting our ministry work, both home and abroad. So if God leads you to give to UCC today, simply text the word GIVE to the number on your screen. If you haven't done so, you can also automate your giving on our website at ucov.com give. Another way you can partner with us in ministry is by sharing this video. A simple message on social media, email, or text could be the beginning of a family member, friend, or neighbor coming to know Jesus. So we encourage you to copy the link in the, to this video and paste it in a message to someone that God may be laying on your heart. If you need help sharing the video, text SHARE to the number on your screen. Thanks again for being here with us online today. We hope you join us again next week as we continue in our series through the book of Ruth. Now receive this benediction. University Covenant Church, may you seek out those around you who you can sponsor and elevate and seek out the community of believers. We cannot do this life or this spiritual journey alone. Be a connector, be a benefactor, be the hands and feet of Jesus in our community and those in your life. Go in peace.